welcome to the Clinical Pre-Hospital Care Research Forum Journal Club. Here in our PCRF Journal Club, we promote evidence-based practices by critically evaluating the latest science in emergency medical services. We hope our discussion will help advance EMS practice. Through the generous support of our sponsors, Limmer Education and ESO, we are able to make science more accessible and understandable. All right, everyone, welcome to the June 2022 edition of the Pre-Hospital Care Research Forum Journal Club podcast. I'm Remley Crow. Today, I am joined by Dr. Tony Fernandez, Dave Page, and Dr. Bill Toon. We also have with us the senior author of today's paper, Dr. Jennifer Fish. And just as a reminder, the name of the article we'll be reviewing is the Child Opportunity Index and Pediatric Emergency Medical Services Utilization that was published in Pre-Hospital Emergency Care. It is hot off the press. And as always, our discussion is gonna be paired with a column written by Dr. Tony Fernandez in EMS World called Journal Watch. So I encourage all of you to go check out those articles on emsworld.com under education and training. And I wanna thank all of you in the audience for joining us today. As we begin, I wanna remind you that you can use the chat feature on your screen to type in any questions or comments, and we'll be bringing those into that conversation as we go. So thank you all for being here. And I'll get us kicked off by inviting Dr. Fish to the stage. Hi, Romley, thanks for having me. Welcome, thank you so much for being here. So I think our audience would benefit from, if you wouldn't mind just talking a little bit about what you currently do, and I'm curious how you got into EMS research. Sure, I'm a clinical assistant professor of emergency medicine at the University of Florida College of Medicine in Jacksonville. I'm also an EMS medical director for pediatrics for two local EMS agencies. And uh, the way I got into EMS was through my fellowship training at Johns Hopkins in Maryland. I was fortunate that my fellowship director and research mentor was Dr. Jennifer Anders, and she's still a research collaborator today. And she's, um, as many of you may know, or have uh, attended her lectures or read her articles and, and her publications, she's uh, heavily involved in pediatric EMS research and clinical care, not only uh, in the state of Maryland, but also nationwide. And so um, I, I got the bug from her. And so after I finished fellowship, I was, uh, fully convinced that I needed to make my academic and research and, and clinical career uh, really centered on the pediatric um, EMS care, so the pre-hospital care of children. So that's that's how that happened. And then uh, after I moved back to Florida, where I'm originally from, I became involved in education and then later uh, clinical oversight with two EMS agencies and continued my research. And that's what's got me here today. Awesome, well, we have Dr. Andrews to thank for sure. And uh, for those in the audience, unusual and really special is that Dr. Fish does a lot of her own statistics. She plays in the statistical packages. And so I'm curious, how did, how did you get into the point where you were doing your own data analysis or, or you know, how did you even approach getting started with that? Yeah, I have a quantitative background from undergrad. I went to MIT. So I have a, a long um, buried past in data science and, and quantitative work and uh, put that in the back Burner after I went to medical school to focus on becoming a good clinician. And then when I got into research, I just found it more expedient to merge into one person, that person being me, <laughs> the <laughs> data analysis and, um, and also the organization of the research study. And it's I would encourage anyone who, who wants to be a researcher, you don't have to go and get a PhD in statistics, but you could really help that statistician you're partnering with by learning how to at least do some data cleaning and, and some statistical program like SAS or R. Because I find, you know, when I get NEMSIS data or when I get ESO data for a project, it really helps that I have a clinical knowledge when I'm going through and looking at those initial lists of data tables. And, you know, I, I know what EMS is doing when they're saying, you know, pediatric assessment as a procedure and adult assessment as a procedure. Whereas a biostatistician who doesn't know very much about the EMS world might not necessarily know what that means. So over the years, I've just found it to be more expedient and best for the projects to do a lot of that myself. So that, that and I would second that. I mean, you know, definitely learning a statistical package feels like it's one of those things that's really intimidating, but there's so many free videos on YouTube these days. And it's a really useful skill if you just want to take a quick look at something and don't need to wait, you know, for 
however long it takes to get your statistician to be able to look at something. So I definitely like oh, nerd <laughs> nerd talk. This is too soon. Stop it. No, it's not. We're going to talk about methods. It's totally fine. <laughs> Math nerds unite. Um, but yeah, I, mean, I think that that's a good piece of advice is to not necessarily be intimidated to get started. We just held a research forum uh, not too long ago here in Austin where we took, you know, paramedics and EMTs who have never done research and paired them up with statisticians to dive into the question. And I'll tell you, as one of the statisticians on those projects, I learned so much from being connected to somebody who lives and uses the front end of where the data got collected. Um, some funny examples came out of there where uh, you know, me, the statistician, I'm interpreting this data element. Oh, we'll just use this cutoff. And the paramedic goes, I don't think you want to do that because here's what I do in the field. <laughs> so it's so valuable. And I'm really glad that you're here today. I know that we have a paper that we want to talk about. So this particular paper in PEC was looking at EMS use for children specifically and looking at some of the relationships with structural, economic, environmental conditions. Uh, collectively, we'll talk about what the child opportunity index is. But I'm curious, what made you decide to tackle the research question related to EMS use and these determinants of health? Yeah, it's a good question to start off with. So uh, I wanted to give full credit before I get started to the full study team. So um, Ram, uh, Ram Gopal, uh, Lindsay Jager, Angela Cerconi, and, and Christian Martin-Gill, um, who rounded out all the authors on this paper. And so this is really uh, Ram's idea, but it's something that all of us on the paper have looked at in some tangential way, whether it's with a large national data set or a local or regional data set. And so that, that question is, you know, we, we talk a lot about EMS clinical care, but less studied, but, you know, in need of more study is EMS logistics and resource use. And that encompasses everything from, you know, wow, your city actually got some money and you get to build a new ambulance station, where do you put it, to staffing, to targeted education for either clinical conditions or just for general pediatric assessment, um, because you can't be everywhere at all times and you only have a limited amount of resources. Um, and you know, even the most well-funded EMS agencies run into resource constraints at some point. Uh, and so better understanding when and where uh, children call 911 or someone calls 911 for a child is really important. And then also in terms of thinking about a more holistic approach to the whole continuum of emergency care, what is it in those environments um, that contribute to those emergencies? Um, and then the other part of this is there has been some preliminary work, not only from the United States, but also from Scandinavia that sort of suggested that in more lower resource areas, there was a higher volume of EMS calls. And part of the speculation as to why was, um, I mean, what we can sort of crudely call uh, how people refer to it as the, the cabulance phenomenon, and that it's more of a transportation service than an emergency medical service. And so one of our reasons to look at a large data set like Nemesis was to see, you know, is there something there? Because then you could do something about that. Um, if there was more, a larger number of medical or surgical events or traumatic events that actually need EMS care in those lower resource agencies, then we can tackle that problem too, but you're going to have a different solution. And so that was, I think, part of uh, Rom's original question when he approached me about partnering on this analysis. And then we kind of figured out all the details from there. Um, the other interesting thing when you talk about environments is there's so many different ways to quantify an environment. And we can talk about that later. Um, there's various indices um, and you know, probably new ones being created and published today that we'll have to update for. Um, and so we can talk about this later, but we chose to use the Childhood Opportunity Index which is a relatively newer measure, um, but because we were focusing on pediatrics, we felt that this was the best available way to broadly characterize uh, the different encounters uh, in terms of the environment that they occurred in. Yeah, absolutely. I'm still working on the Remley Index one of these days. <laughs> yes. But, but you know, before we dive into it, if you would like. <laughs> it's, it's going to happen. Uh, but before we dive in, you know, to this specific index, uh, I think it's worth pausing and talking a little bit about, you know, we talked about structural planning and resources, and collectively there's this concept of social determinants of health, but that's not always included in our early education around, you know, EMS sits at the intersection between public safety, public health, and healthcare, but social determinants of health have a lot to do with what we end up seeing and being able to do as EMS clinicians. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about social determinants of health and why that matters for EMS research. 
Sure. So, you know, for those who aren't familiar, social determinants of health encompass kind of all the non-traditional medical uh, variables that actually what we know do end up influencing your health outcomes. So that could be anything from what we call your built environment. So are you growing up in a place that has absolutely no green space? And, you know, that in of itself can lead to more, uh, you know, exposure to environmental toxins, less opportunity to have a, a healthy lifestyle in terms of, you know, safety and parks to play. Um, it, it also, you know, there's very good data that, to suggest that living in an impoverished environment um, actually changes your epigenetics. Um, and so through that, you know, affects a n number of um, real biomedical outcomes. Um, and so really everything from, you know, uh, how, you know, you're perceived and the people you interact with and those types of interactions to more structured things like, you know, how much green space is there in their, your zip code, um, how many abandoned houses uh, are there. There was a paper that um, came out that looked at various environmental determinants of COVID mortality and found a, that you know, the number of abandoned homes within a certain diam uh, certain radius of the, the patient's house had a, a very strong association with how they did in terms of their COVID outcomes. Um, so, you know, the broad definition would be anything that's like not traditionally medical, you know, um, meaning, you know, age or, you know, your renal function status, um, but more environmental um, and sociologic factors that we know um, are either associated with health outcomes or like in the case of that ep epigenetic example, actually change, you know, gene expression and uh, the proteins floating around in your body and, and thus actually really do directly affect the change in your, your health status. Yeah, I love that. And I love that this research is laying a framework for us to think about these kinds of external factors that aren't directly perhaps related to EMS, but as we plan resources and systems, it's really important to consider. Now, I, I gave Dr. Toon a reprieve for just a minute there on the nerd talk, but I am going to invite Dr. Fernandez to join, and we're going to talk through some of the methods of this work. And so, sorry, Dr. Toon, you're outnumbered. Nerds run strong. All right, Tony, so take yeah. us away. Let's talk a little bit about these methods. I will. And good afternoon, all. And <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Fish, for joining us today. I think this is a really cool study, um, and I'm excited that we get an opportunity to uh, to chat about it today. So, <clears throat> we did talk a little bit about uh, social determinants of health, but in in your paper, you specifically used the Child Opportunity Index, and I was wondering, can you uh, take some time to introduce us and our audience to this index and and give us a little bit of information about why you thought this was uh, a good measure for evaluating socioeconomic status in your study? Sure, absolutely. So the Childhood Opportunity Index is a composite measure. So meaning you, you get a score of sorts, but what goes into that score is a, a number of, of variables. I believe there's 20-something uh, variables in the Childhood Opportunity Index. And what, you know, a few examples, I've got it pulled up on, on my screen now, are um, you know, the number of early childhood education centers within a five mile radius of this um, data point, either, you know, a G, you know, GPS coordinate or zip code, depending on how granular your geospatial data is. Um, housing vacancy rate, which I just mentioned, is, is another um, part of this composite um, score. Um, teacher experience, so um, the percent of teachers and the schools in that area who are in their first or second year, you know, so a high degree of teacher turnover is something that's very problematic for more urban, under-resourced inner city schools. Um, toxic ex exposure, so uh, microparticles, so particulate matter, um, you know, 2.5 and other sorts of um, sulfur dioxide and ozone um, that's in the atmosphere in that area is another part of the Childhood Opportunity Index. So you can see that it's very um, wide in its, you know, breadth of the different um, things that it measures. But what distinguishes it from other indices is its focus on education. So there's, you know, over 10 education related measurements. And so that's really where it um, speaks more to the health and the environment for children versus other indices like the Area Deprivation Index, um, which has educational elements in there. It's just not weighed quite as much as it is in the Childhood Opportunity Index, and they're of a little different variety. But there are certainly variables that you know, make up each that are included in both and are salient to, to this paper. Um, so the reason we chose Childhood Opportunity Index was just we felt like even though it's not 
uber validated for use in the pre-hospital or even emergency setting. Um, we felt like it was more tailored to the health and the environment of children versus adults. And since this was a pediatric focused study, that's why we picked um, the Childhood Opportunity Index. It is a young index. It's um, not in as many papers as ADI. So that's sort of the trade off there. It is on its second version. So version 2.0 is, is what we learned used. Um, and then of note, there's three different domains that comprise it. So education, health and environment, and then social and economic that has a poverty, unemployment rate, home ownership rate. And you can use those three sort of subgroups and analyze by those subgroups. But what we we did was we took the whole childhood opportunity index that has all three of those groups in there. Yeah, and I think it's a really fascinating measure. Um, and the way you applied it, I think is is, is great. Um, so you, you chose to use the NEMSIS data set. And I, I think that that's um, really interesting that you didn't do this, uh, decided not to do this locally or um, with with, the, with in one or two EMS systems, you use the national EMS data set. And I, I wanted to kind of dive into a little more about why you think that was more appropriate than um, doing something more localized? And uh, how, how did you see that this data set, the NEMSIS data set specifically, would help you meet your study objectives? Yeah, that's a great question. The, the previous studies that had looked at this um, were all local or regional, or in the case of the Scandinavian study that was done in Finland. It's all of Finland, but that's a more heterogeneous population, and it's not as easily transferable to the United States. Um, and, you know, there's the saying, when you look at one EMS agency, you've looked at one EMS agency. So we were hoping for something a little bit more generalizable. The other reason for doing that is a sort of matching measure to substrate, which is that the Childhood Opportunity Index doesn't come from one region. It's more of a nationally derived composite measure. And so we thought it was more appropriate to apply, you know, apply that to a national data set. What we lost with that was granularity of the geospatial data. So NEMSIS, you know, has zip code of encounters. And so we based our COI data points off of the zip code of the EMS encounter. And we can talk about that in limitations, the pros and cons there. Whereas if we had worked with one EMS agency or um, as I've done before in the past, gotten like a statewide EMS data set with the exact you know, address of the EMS scenes and even perhaps the exact patient address, we could have done a little bit more interesting comparisons and statistics, but we would have lost that national applicability. And so in some of the tables, you can see we do divide some things by region and you can see that there's there's some significant and there's some non-statistically significant differences by region, um, particularly in the rural South, which I feel like deserves a little bit of attention based on the results of this paper. And so we would have lost that if we had just gone for a, a more regional approach. So, um, but of course, when you get a NEMSIS data set, it's, uh, it's not identifiable data. Um, you lose a little bit of the detail. You lose the opportunity to do something cool like not natural language processing and look at the EMS provider free text notes, which is something that Remley and I are really jazzed about doing. Um, so, you know, always trade-offs in life. But because the biggest limitation of the previous studies on this were that they weren't a bigger setting, we just chose the bigger setting. Yeah, and I think that was a, a great decision. Now, one of the things, we, we have a lot of new and, and budding researchers who listen to this podcast. And um, as we dive into talking a little bit, a bit more about the NEMSIS data set, um, folks may be, may be aware that NEMSIS typically is a de-identified data set, and you're, they're not just going to deliver you um, uh, zip codes for you to do your analysis. So can you walk us through a little bit how uh, you worked with NEMSIS to uh, combine the uh, Childhood Opportunity Index uh, with the NEMSIS data set? Yeah, so um, great team at NEMSIS. I've worked with them over the years and um, always have a good experience. So that's true. They will not email you even in a nice secure file uh, zip codes that are associated with the uh, encounter IDs. Um, because, you know, per, per HIPAA, um, a zip code is an identifiable data point. So what you end up, what we ended up doing, and by we, I mean Ram, uh, he uh, took uh, <laughs> the, you know, the uh, Childhood Opportunity uh, Index data, um, uh, a little bit of a reverberation, sorry about that. Uh, but you can download you can off download the Childhood Opportunity, opportunity Index data, data linked to zip codes. Yeah. Send that to Nemesis. They will link they will that, link that on, their on their back end, then back, back the, the 
Childhood Opportunity Index score to speak to you. To you. Very nice. Yeah, and that that had to help. Um, one, that's not an easy test. So I, the Nemesis is great for doing that. And two, that that uh, made made your job a little bit easier. So I think that um, that they worked for both ends. Um, now, as we move forward uh, through through your analysis, one of the other things you did was you classified uh, primary impression data using uh, diagnosis and grouping systems. Um, that's also something that we don't often see uh, as much as we might in, in EMS research. So uh, can you give us a, a little bit of a background of why you chose to do that and kind of um, how that impacted your study? Yeah, there's no, no. and I'm sorry, hold on, sorry, let me try. Hold on, audio. Let me try. Is that better? Great. There's no universal EMS primary impression grouping that's widely accepted at this point. Uh, various people have put forth classification systems for those primary impressions. Um, and you know, most people are on, although not everyone, so that is a limitation of the NEMSYS data set, most people are on the NEMSYS variables. Um, whether they're at the most up-to-date version or not is, is another question too. Um, so there's, you really, it's kind of the wild west for how you want to group these things. But you just, you definitely don't want to have a table of 30 diagnosis codes or primary impressions and secondary impressions. So what, what we ended up doing was we, we used the diagnosis code groupings just because we thought if somebody from the more inpatient setting, for, say for example, the ED, wanted to take our methods and replicate them in their ED environment, this would be a more transferable way. And my two cents is that that's how us as EMS researchers should think about grouping these types of primary and secondary impressions. Um, yes, we're super special. We're special snowflakes for pre-hospital researchers, but we do want to be able to transfer our knowledge back and forth, especially with the ED environment. And the holy grail of everything we're looking at is, well, what happens with the patient in the ED in the hospital? So the more chances we have to adopt something, even if it's something as simple and small as categorization of primary impressions, that can be transferred back and forth with, say, an, a data set from, you know, the ESO, you know, research exchange, right? Uh, that's that's the reason for doing that. Um, I am aware of, you know, other papers who have sort of ad hoc class, you know, developed a classification um, and some other, you know, uh, you know, EMS specific ways that were replicated in multiple studies. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if like Pittsburgh has their own classification system because they're Pittsburgh. But uh, that was <laughs> the reason we used we used uh, the more sort of inpatient e categorization was you know if somebody from the inpatient setting wanted to replicate this and you know and future work we could maybe make it more transferable. I think it's worth pausing and talking about you know how those primary impressions are actually captured too because as a front end user as an EMT in the street you know I'm used to seeing chest pain non-traumatic okay uh, but what's going on behind the scenes is that is getting mapped to a code which is an icd-10 which is a diagnosis code uh, and then researchers are getting this massive list of codes so we're talking you know, hundreds and thousands of codes and different vendors and even different agencies can be using different codes so it's really important what you all did by grouping them in a way that no matter what system we're using this is transferable not only to other fields but within ems we could all replicate this so that was a great way of doing this yeah i, I agree guess, and please I was just gonna say, again credit credit to rom for really mapping this all out in his head <laughs> that, that was wonderful yeah, and for those of you listening i i just want to emphasize this is all work that had to be done before they even got into their main analysis and this is not easy work so this is this is a lot of of, of crunching and and sitting in a room and agreeing with co-authors and kind of hashing through this so um i commend you on the work you've done uh in, on this study and there's just a couple more ways that i really found fascinating the way you analyzed uh, and, and categorized your data um, and i just want to dive into those a little bit before we we run into the method, the results. Um, so you say you use EMS data in a couple ways for proxy measures. So you use proxy measures for disease acuity, you, you use some EMS data as proxy measures for resource use, and again, different um, EMS specific elements for uh, proxy measures of disparities in care. 
And can you walk us through some of those decisions and in, in how you uh, decided that these, these sets of EMS data could be uh, proxy measures for A, B, or C? Yeah, so there's nothing, no perfect way to do this, but um, for example, a proxy measure for asthma or respiratory exacerbation severity would be, you know, did, did EMS administer a bronchodilator? Because there are plenty of calls out there for asthma attacks where, you know, the patient was really feeling terrible, took six puffs of their inhaler while they waited for the ambulance, and then, you know, they're doing better, and so, you know, EMS isn't doing active, you know, interventions. Um, so that's kind of a, a nice binary way to sort of say, you know, just, you know, more severe or less severe type of respiratory um, exacerbation. Um, and then for, you know, something like seizure, administration of a benzodiazepine, well, that's, you know, that won't capture all active seizures that EMS attends to, but when you, when it's given, it's almost 100% of the time given because somebody is actively seizing. There's a very, you know, kind of low rate of EMS administering those things when someone's not seizing um, for the seizure category. Um, so, you know, be, the other consideration with this is you could develop surrogate measures for every single one of those diagnosis code groupings, um, but you just want to spend the time and thought to do it for the things that are most common or most consequential for example, like trauma and cardiac arrest. Um, the other way we sort of, looked at the different patient presentations in terms of severity was um, to calculate Z-scores for the different vital signs. Um, and so that's just sort of creating a, a distribution of the variation in vital signs because they're, you know, vital signs are on a continuum and there's continuums of normal and then there's continuums of abnormal. Um, and so we defined, you know, abnormal as anything that was two standard deviations um, from from the mean um, and in either direction because uh, there is a, such a thing as bradycardia in children that's undertreated, um, which is another uh, interest of mine from uh, previous research. Um, and the only one where we didn't do that was oxygen saturation, where it's you know it's kind of a one way street. <laughs> so we we went with less than 90%. Um, although the cutoff for that is controversial because if you talk to some pulmonologists, they'll tell you 94, and if you talk to some other people, they'll tell you 92. Um, and then, you know, uh, also administration of pain for uh, pain medications for trauma patients. Um, not the best surrogate measure, frankly, just because pain is so undertreated, especially in children and especially in um, minority children. Um, but for the lack of anything better, we, we use that. Um, now, if we had worked with a more local or regional data set, we could have gotten a trauma category um, to use instead. But because we were uh, using Nemesis, we had to use something like that. Yeah, I, I think you made some really wise decisions uh, leading up to this analysis, and um, your, your analysis was was really interesting, and I always have the unenviable task of holding folks uh, back before we get to what your analysis actually planned. But before we do that, um, I do want to open it up to the rest of our panelists to see if there are any other methods-related questions um, that we wanted to talk about before we actually get to these really interesting results. Well, I just want to congratulate you, too, and and this is fascinating. I really am interested in disparities in care. And when we see disparities, like, you know, just the small mention you just made of, we see such disparities in pain management. And how do we, how are we able to address that in a large NEMSIS data set that um, allows that, that those, the, the methods allow us to get to those questions but you have to be very careful and people assume that you can just um, study something by looking at well was you know was there pain meds given in one situation or another and yet some of the some of the some of the ways in which we address pain might be in a rural area with a basic life support ambulance uh, somebody put on an ice pack uh, somebody distracted the child with a video and these are difficult to tease out when it's not really a field in the NEMSIS database to play a video or, you know, give the child a, a, a you know, a, a teddy bear. And, uh, and so uh, just getting at some of these differences in, in care and especially if we compare them between groups is I think just very commendable. So I can't wait to get to results. I'm just gonna shut up because I, I wanna see what what the punchline is. <laughs> 
All right, I guess we'll move there. But I do want to commend again that use of z-scores for the vital signs because it's a challenge when we're doing pediatric research in particular because of the different ranges for the different age groups. Like we wouldn't expect one heart rate, you know, for toddlers to be the same as in adolescents. Uh, so I think that was a really nice way of handling it and something that's also replicable. So that was great. Um, but all right, I guess we'll do the drum roll and we'll go into the results because these are huge, quite literally. So starting off with a data set of nothing other than 34 million records. Somebody's computer was sweating, this I know. Hopefully it was a cloud. Um, and then after exclusions, we see that the amount of pediatric encounters that ended up in this analysis is nearly 1.3 million. Uh, and, and that's probably by far one of the largest studies using this index looking at pediatric EMS encounters. And we can or imagine that could be a ton of Period, mm -hmm. yeah. And then just for the audience, this number is on par with what we've seen in previous NEMSIS data sets in terms of pediatric encounters by a year. So a good rule of thumb for EMS is that, you know, nationwide, there's about 1 to 1 1.5 million kids who receive, you know, 911 scene responses. Because again, we've excluded interfacility facility and, and other types of, you know, mutual aid kind of things. Right, absolutely. And I, I think that's an important gut check. We talked about how much time we probably spend up front making the decisions and doing the data wrangling is probably more than the actual analysis itself. Uh, and, and that's a really important piece of this is figuring out who's in and who's out. So ruling out inner facilities. Another thing I take out of figure one is a quick gut check on how, how much missing data could have affected our study. So in this case, we see zip code wasn't missing all that frequently. So you know, 68,000 out of 34 million is not a whole lot. Right, right. But I mean, it's interesting that 5.2 million didn't have an age documented, which, um, you know, I'm, I'm guessing most of those are adults. Um, and if there are any children in there that they're extremely critically ill, you know, cardiac arrest patients, or it's somehow an, an encounter that was open in error and somehow still erroneously submitted to NEMSIS that made it past all the QC checks. Absolutely. No. And, and that's a key part, you know, as we think as providers, you know, uh, what do I have to write down the age for? It's, it becomes really important later on for performance improvement and research efforts. So I want to dig into some of the some of the things that we that you found. There are a couple of different breakdowns here. We talked about the 1.2 million encounters past gut check. About half were male, maybe slightly more, uh, and the median age was 10 years. So I, I think that's important, and I commend use of median because it tells us you know 50% of the patients were older than 10 and 50% were younger than 10. So um, I, I, that's an important piece. We talk about pediatric research a lot and how hard it is to define what is a pediatric patient even between studies. So I like that you laid out here, you know, we included anyone under the age of 18 and then we can see, uh, well, the bulk of, uh, you know, these patients falls, you know, in the older age range than the tiny, tiny children. Yeah, and then while we're on here, for the audience who's not familiar with the Child Opportunity Index or um, how actually like most of these indexes work, so you don't get um, you don't get a numerical score per se, or at least we didn't represent the numerical scores, um, and it's not an absolute value um, as opposed to something like oxygen saturation, where 95 means 95. Um, it's all relative. Um, and so all the data that's put into the Child Opportunity Index gets divided up into quintiles. So five, you know, uh, categories ascending. So very high means the highest opportunity, the best composite score on all of those measures we talked about earlier. And then going down to very low um, would be the lowest. Um, and so this is all relative. If you were to, for example, transfer the Childhood Opportunity Index to a developing third world country, um, you would still have five quintiles but they would mean very different things. Um, and so this you know, index is developed and, and validated in, in the United States. Um, and so probably at this point should only be used in the United States, um, but this is how you interpret that data. It's all relative. Um, and so when we talk about the very low quintile, which was our, it, it wasn't initially our area of focus, but it ended up being after we got these first figures um, for the frequency of encounters between the quintiles, um, you know, that's, that's important to know that relative to all four of those other quintiles, statistically um, and also just literally, um, these areas have a very high area of deprivation, or you could say a very low um, index of opportunity. 
Absolutely. And I think these numbers, you know, the first line of table one is really important because we see about 15% of the population is in that very high. And then we see it increase by small steps until we get, you know, low is at 20%, just to put things in perspective. But then when we get to the very low, 30.6%. So that is almost one in three encounters are going to be in this classification. Right. Which, um, it, you know, it jives with the other research on this, um, but puts it in a more quantitative perspective um, based off of this index, which is that, you know, there is a much higher frequency of encounters coming from these areas. Um, but, you know, we'll get to our punchline, you know, the, the what and the why is uh, mm -hmm. what we found is different um, than I think what a lot of people think and then what some other research has hinted at. Yeah, absolutely. And this first table just helps us compare, you know, are there demographic differences that could account for any differences in outcomes that we may see later on? So I think it is important, you know, to give this table a good study. I love that there's not a p-value column because let me tell you, when you have uh, over 1.2 million records, everything's statistically significant, but yeah. this leaves it to us to determine, is that practically important and should we, you know, have this in consideration? So a couple of things that even stuck out to me, and I'll be curious to hear if they stuck out to you as well, is in the lower age group, there's also this kind of stepwise increase as you go from very high to very low in terms of children being in the younger age categories, which we mm -hmm. traditionally think about seeing the children in the older age categories. Yeah, and that's important for you know what this research could inform. You know, if we're talking about more education and more resources, it's not going to be for um, you know it, it, maybe it's not necessarily as important for the adolescent and school age years as it is for infants. Um, and that also comports with other research that talks about, you know, infant mortality being on the rise in some areas in the United States in areas that are more deprived than others. Um, and so perhaps we're seeing that manifested in EMS calls for children in that zero to five year age range. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then when we get down to things like urbanicity, we also see a little bit of a difference there with those in that very high opportunity of being more urban than some of those in the lower opportunity classifications. I think yeah. that also from the systems approach is really important to take into account. Yeah, and you know, there's we could have a whole podcast on how to classify urbanicity because there's so many okay. different classifications. And I know you and I have had many emails back and forth about which is the best one. Um, you know, this is a you know a, a smaller categorization. You can get ones that are you know suburban adjacent to large urban metro area and suburban adjacent to no urban metro area um so you, i mean there's almost you know there's one that has almost 12 uh, categorizations for this but I, I think the interesting story from this is that the image many people have in their head of an area of high deprivation or low childhood opportunity is uh, an urban in, inner city area still true um, but what the low and very low proportion of, you know, rural areas and certainly how um, much lower they were in urban um, paints, a, you know, a tale that you should also include a more rural picture in there, too. Um, and there are certainly rural areas of the United States where um, EMS agencies aren't really operating anymore um, for various financial and, and other uh, government reasons. Um, and so we should not glance over the, the rural issue here. Um, and as we point out in the paper, particularly in the South, um, although, you know, all areas um, for sure, but that was a, a big, a big finding, I think that's worth underscoring. Yeah, I think this is a, a finding that warrants highlighting when we talk about workforce shortage and when we talk about rural response and there being already difficulties in staffing to think about who's likely to be affected and to think about when we talk about pediatric readiness, uh, you know, taking these into consideration when we're thinking about uh, who do, you know, how are we going to staff our ambulances and what capabilities are we going to need? Right. And um, one of the other speakers earlier was talking about, you know, how you would educate a BLS versus an ALS provider. Um, and so you're more likely to have a BLS or, or the, the elusive intermediate responder in, in some of these locations. And so you have to think about that, too. Um, the answer is always more funding for EMS, but we have to think about more funding and resources for some of these rural areas, too. It's good to have data when we go to ask for more funding, for sure. Always, always. Uh, and then the rest of table one, some other things that were looked at here. And again, this is just important to keep in mind as we're thinking about the outcomes, which are going to come here in a moment. But you're talking about where the EMS responses are happening. So 
uh, whether it was in somebody's home or at school or in a public place. And we do see a pattern there with more of those in the very low category occurring at home in a private residence versus at school or in a public area. Yeah, and I'd like to call attention to one of the limitations of this study, which is that we had, um, well, NEMSIS very graciously mapped COI for us based on the scene encounter address, which is not necessarily the COI where the patient resides and where they spend most of their time. Um, you know, people travel, they go on vacations, people go across town for school or for business or for work or for play. Um, now, there's other papers that suggest that, you know, most EMS encounters for someone occur within a certain, you know, short distance from where they actually reside or spend the most of their time, and that many of these private residences are going to be the home of the child, um, but it's not necessarily a one-for-one -one deal. And so, a future study I'd like, I'd like to do would be, you know, comparing the childhood opportunity index between the scene address and the residence, the true residence, um, and see, you know, how, how many times is it actually substantively different. Because I think, you know, if you're talking about low versus very low, that might not make a, as big of a difference as high versus very low. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, to call out, it also could be a strength of this paper as uh, we're talking about you know, EMS resource planning and where EMS responds to the incident. So it's important, you know, to think about both of these. And I, I like that idea of a future paper comparing you know, how often are these things different, one, and then two, does it really change the direction of the findings in any way that we should be aware of? Um, but again, it all just matters on what questions being asked. Is it the trait inherent to the person or is it the system that's responding, you know, at the place of response? Yeah, it's a very interesting question to talk about. More work for us in the future. Yes. I love research because it just makes more questions. Uh, then when we look at table two, this was your look at the EMS, some of the EMS encounter characteristics. So looking at things like time of the day, what was the scene, uh, time spent on scene, what was the transport time, response times, and all of those things. And here, one of the things that was encouraging to me in a way was that the response times are, are pretty similar across groups, yep. Yep. Um, as well as scene times relatively similar. Um, and as well, the transport times as well. So, you know, we're thinking of, oh, is it taking us much longer to get there or to get somewhere? Uh, I think that this this is an encouraging picture here at the very least. Yeah, definitely. There, you know, the only substantive difference that um, we really have on this table between the different COI uh, quintiles is fire department response for very mm -hmm. high versus low and very low is, you know, substantively more. Um, what that means, I don't know, um, and I don't know if it's, you know, what we would say, is it clinically significant or not? Um, so, you know, that's something I think, you know, people can think about and decide for themselves. Uh, I think another myth that's dispelled in this is that, you know, areas of more lower opportunity call the cabulance at two in the morning because they don't have a ride or they don't want to drive or whatever. Um, and we see absolutely no difference really in time of day. Um, and I, like you said, I, I think it's you know, very heartening as a EMS medical director to see there's really no difference in the scene response intervals and, and this, the on-scene time. You know, so people aren't scooping and running more with one versus another. Right, and I think that's really, the scoop and run concept is really important, especially when we're talking about pediatric response. And I think this, this table in and of itself could make for a great episode of EMS Mythbusters. Uh, and then moving through the rest of the table here, we've got you know, primary impressions. Um, I didn't see any immediate big differences here. I don't know if there's any that you want to call out. There really aren't, um, to be honest with you. And again, this is another sort of myth busting thing. Um, and we'll, you know, when we get to some of the next tables, then we can, you know, blow the mist out of the water. But um, there really isn't, you know, any big difference in what people and what EMS is being called for amongst these different quintile areas. Yeah, absolutely. And the, in the next one, you know, they say, we looked at a couple of tables, but the picture paints the thousand words. So I want to highlight the figure. I think that this tells an important story. So you talked earlier about, hey, we called out a couple of conditions that we think are really important, particularly when we're talking about pediatric emergency response. So looking at respiratory conditions, things like asthma and some of the things that we go on commonly, but that have a high risk if not treated, as well as seizure. Uh, and then looking at trauma and pain medication. So if we look at the dark bars, we see for respiratory patients, we, we see an increase in the amount of treatment there. So the percentage-wise, there's an increase as you go from very high to very low. 
And perhaps you want to weigh in on a little bit of why you think we see that for pediatric respiratory emergencies. Yeah, there's probably several reasons. Since asthma is my primary focus of study, my um, my two cents is that the exacerbations that are being treated in the low and very low categories are more severe. Or um, the uh, people who are calling 911 or the child themselves, be it at school or at home or wherever, uh, don't have access to uh, first-line inhaled bronchodilators to, um, to treat themselves before EMS arrives. And thus, when EMS arrives on scene, the child's in a worse state. Um, and so we see a higher percentage of administration of, of bronchodilators uh, from EMS and other respiratory medications um, for, for, you know, the same disease category in that low and certainly in that very low uh, quintile. Um, and so this gets to that, um, you know, impression I was talking about at the beginning of this podcast, which is that, yeah, there's more calls from these areas, but they're not as sick. You know, uh, this this says the exact opposite. Um, mm -hmm. Again, like we said, 1.3 million patients. Yeah, and then when we look at seizure, I see the bars are pretty even height in terms of who received a medication for seizure. So again, paints that picture of acuity is probably pretty similar across the categories. Correct. Uh, but then the the part that I really want to highlight, and this is something that Dave mentioned earlier, is the trauma and the pain medication. We see a sort of stepwise decrease. And we've seen this over and over again in adults, but it's interesting to see that the same trend holds true even when we're talking about a pediatric population. Yeah, and it would be great to balance this with more granular information on the type of trauma and the severity. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly, like we've mentioned before, we already know that pain is really undertreated in children, not, not just by EMS, but by emergency department providers and inpatient providers in a hospital. Um, part of that has to do with, you know, especially younger children are at different developmental stages and it's really hard to get an assessment of their pain. Um, and, but this is, you know, it's just the opposite of the asthma bars, you know, um, you know, significant decrease in administration of pain medication. But I, I would note for everybody overall, it's less than 10% in all the quintiles. It's shockingly yes. low. Um, and so and I bet that goes down as you get into the younger age groups, too. Yeah. So the take, you know, I think two, two big take homes from this is um, it's unacceptably low in the low and the very low quintiles. And we have to work to understand why that it's a disparity. Why does that disparity exist? But then we have to work across the board to increase these numbers, because sure, not every child who's classified as a trauma necessarily needs a pharmacologic medication for their pain. They could do distraction, they could do something else. Maybe their pain is more anxiety and you could do something to alleviate that. But I guarantee you, I'm willing to bet quite a bit that more than 10% of these children need some sort of pain medication. It doesn't have to be an opioid, but it could be something. Um, and so, you know, there's some really talented pain researchers out there and I would love for them to kind of take that, take that and um, run with it because the, these numbers need to go up. Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, yeah I, I could do a TLDR version of figure two. It's more calls, not less severe, probably more severe, and trauma patients not getting the pain meds they need. Yeah, I, I think that's a pretty big headline right there. It's definitely, what is the tweet of this paper? Here is the tweet. Yeah. Um, yes. If Henry Wang's listening, there you go. <laughs> Um, I'm going to move us to this table, and I'm also going to invite any of the other panelists who may have questions, so I don't take up all the space, but this is, there's some really important and fascinating findings here, but I'll pause for a moment and let you jump in, Dave. I just feel like I, I can't add any more uh, emphasis to what you're saying, like it's just glaringly, uh, you know, the, 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 it's like a aha moment of we have, we have data that clearly show uh, the, the, the disparity. And, you know, it's low already, but it's really low. And if you go from like 7.4 to 4.0 in the analgesia provided, I think it's fascinating that, that pain scores appear to be, uh, gotten on all, all patients of all socioeconomic levels. So it may be a little less for, for, uh, very low, but Still, we, we seem to get to vital signs. We seem to uh, treat respiratory disease, but we don't treat pain. And, and maybe that has to do with the modalities of treatment. And, and inhaled penthrox, for example, in um, Australia seems to be really common and, uh, in kids and teenagers. So it makes it a little bit easier to, to maybe 
for people on the street to think I'm going to administer something that's inhaled um, mm -hmm. yeah. and that isn't isn't available uh, and maybe poses a barrier. But um, I, I do think the this concept of that the the patients that are sicker are in a lower socioeconomic uh, status is maybe not it's not necessarily bearing itself out here um, that uh, we we see across the board the same kind of severity. I, I did wonder if you could go back just a little bit, um, and I don't know if these numbers are significant, which is why you statistical gurus need to need to tell me. In table two, in the organizational type, because uh, I see Beth Adams is with us. Hi, Beth. Uh, and she she was making a comment about fire department versus you know non fire department and the organization type. It, it I just highlighted for myself that uh, obviously there's more uh, page, tribal type ambulance services from uh, tribal areas are seeing more low socioeconomic uh, uh, patients. However, it does look like the opposite occurs with fire departments that would seem to be more urban. Um, and so to Beth's comment, maybe a lot of these fire departments are suburban or rural, I don't know, but um, the inverse is, is looking true for private and hospital-based services that see more patients that are in lower socioeconomic levels. And so is that an unfair burden on private and hospital-based systems and or it, what how do we account for that or is the number so small the difference so small that it really doesn't matter well like Romley said earlier with this large of a data set you're going to get a small p-value no matter what you do even if you adjust for multiple comparisons between the five categories because again if you just run a chi-square or multiple categories you're going to find a difference because you're comparing you know you're making comparisons amongst five different uh results um a couple things on that. So uh, thanks for mentioning the tribal because um, there are no tribal agencies in the high and very high quintiles. So that's something to call attention to. Um, and, you know, although the tribal agencies make a very, very small percentage of the agencies that are included in this, um, they're almost all in the very low quintile. Um, so that's that's something to take note of. Um, you know, the fire department, you know, combined fire EMS versus fire alone and EMS alone, um, a, a couple of things. In rural areas, at least what I see uh, as an observer um, and also someone who works in an area that used to be a rural but is no longer rural, um, there's, you know, a void in or an financial inability for many cities and counties to support an EMS agency. And that leaves an opportunity for a private contractor to come and win a contract with the city based on you know, margins that they can do through economies of scale because they serve many other areas with many ambulances. And so they're relying on you know, not having a lot of calls in one area, it's sort of like an insurance model, frankly. Um, and so that might be why we see more private, um, non-hospital types of organizations in the low and very low than in the high and very high. Um, if it's a city that has a lot of, or a county or a state has a lot of um, property or income tax revenue, um, they can fund, you know, some really nice schools to give you a very high COI, and then they can fund some really nice ambulances too. Um, so that that is my explanation for what we see there. Whether or not something's combined fire EMS, I find to be so difficult to predict. Like I grew up in Miami, where it is combined fire EMS because there are no fires in Miami. Every building's 10 years old, and there's nothing that can catch fire. And if something's older than 10 years, we tear it down and we build something new. Um, and then, or it collapses <laughs> on its own, but that wasn't Miami. I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> and then when I, when I lived in Boston for college, I found out one time walking down the street that, wow, things do catch on fire here. <laughs> <You know? laughs> the, the fire department's a real thing in, in some other cities. So um, it's really hard to, to, I think, gather a lot of meaning from the, the fire part of that table. Okay. Yeah, and I think this, you know, again, all of these are signals and any one of them could be their own research question. So the thing that this paper does nicely is it tells us, you know, if we have limited time and resources in our day, where should we target our next research question? And, and that may be here. Um, we have some really good comments, questions in the chat that I want to bring in. I know we're wrapping up in our last five minutes, but one really important comment from Brandon is about the back to the respiratory medication. So, 
the lack of affordable first line and maintenance medication is something that he's commonly seeing with his patients. And so that may be you know, part of the, the lack of access to that initial medication. And you know, for us in EMS with economic pressure right now, that might be something for us to consider is that could we potentially see an increase in calls for, you know, that could have been treated with maintenance medication, but where it wasn't available. Yeah, hundred um, percent. And that's going to go for both urban and rural areas where you have, especially in rural areas, you have hospitals closing up shop with hospitals closing up shop, the affiliated primary care clinics close too. And although telemedicine offers a path forward for this, it's not, you know, this, it's, it's not adopted widely enough to really make a difference right now. But we do, we do have a lot of children who are not able to access primary care and families can't access that affordably for them. Um, and so there's, you know, delays in diagnosis of, diagnoses of asthma, um, and then people have trouble filling prescriptions or getting prescriptions. So, you know, in an ideal system, if someone is experiencing a mild asthma exacerbation or they, mom knows their child well enough that they can see that, you know, the oak pollen apocalypse has happened outside and they're going to start wheezing any day now, you could call your primary care doctor and get a script for um, corticosteroids and make sure that your albuterol and your spacer are all good to go. Um, and, you know, it's just people people have trouble doing that now because there's some deficiencies in the system. And so I, I see that more in the emergency department now, and I'm sure EMS sees it more now, too. And undoubtedly, this was 2019, so this was a pre-COVID uh, data mm -hmm. set, which we did that intentionally because things got really messed up during COVID. Um, but it's gotten worse since 2020. Yeah, and I think an action item for EMS is to keep an eye on your calls in this category, particularly now, and, and keep an eye on your inventory as well to be prepared in case there is any increase in what we may need in terms of these kinds of medications. Yeah, and for the real go-getters, this is an opportunity for community paramedicine. Absolutely. Uh, I'll leave one last question and then I'll let you have the last word here uh, from Dr. Caleb Ward, who's also done a lot of pediatric EMS research. Uh, he's interested in parsing out or whether you can't parse out socioeconomic status versus race and ethnicity. Uh, do we have any idea about the relationship or collinearity? Um, or what are the challenges associated with teasing out socioeconomic status versus race and ethnicity trends? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Undoubtedly, you're going to find the typical associations that you've already guessed. Um, but in some of these rural areas, you might find some different things than uh, what you, you would think in, in terms of race and ethnicity. Um, and so, you know, you're, you're asking a, a question that I think would take somebody's entire research career to unpack. Um, certainly in that social determinants of health category, some researchers have, have input race and ethnicity as a variable because it affects so many other downstream things. So it's a proxy measure for a lot of different things. Um, but uh, in terms of the Childhood Opportunity Index, that is not included in there because it's focused on the external environment. Um, but, I, you know, uh, if you, and I, I think in our demographic table, um, we might not have included this just because our tables were getting so big. Um, but, you know, you're gonna find, you know, your expected differences in race and ethnicity amongst the quintiles. That makes sense. And I think this lays an important groundwork for us to say that we, we should be looking at both of these variables and taking into consideration um, depends on whether what, what we see we think is resource related or if it's related to potential implicit bias. And it's important to look and see if trends hold even in those higher socioeconomic categories. I'm thinking to a pediatric uh, stand, a bystander CPR paper where the trend held um, across race and ethnicity within the different socioeconomic quartiles. So, I love that you know, this paper is able to break it out and look at some of those external factors that we don't usually get to call into context. Right. Uh, and, now, oh, sorry, I know we're running short of time. Future good ideas would be to look at the provider free text notes and use NLP and look and see what you get based on these different COI quintiles, based off of race and ethnicity, based off of other clinical encounter measures. Um, that would be, I think, a really nice future step. Um, so if anyone from Nemesis is listening, if you want to start including pre-tax data in your data set, that would be really neat. We can send some unsolicited emails now. <laughs> um, I love that. And then I'll leave the last word to you. Um, so is there anything else that you think as EMS, either providers, educators, 
uh, that we should be taking from this paper as we move forward? Yeah, I would say the, um, the bottom line is the myth that you get a lot of calls or in some agencies, most of your calls from areas of what we would call in this paper, lower childhood opportunity. Um, it's, it's not a myth. There are a disproportionate number of calls from that area, but they are not calls for nothing. They are calls that are just as severe, if not more severe, depending on the condition. Um, and we found some really troubling uh, findings with regards to pain medication across all quintiles, but especially in the low and very low, um, that need to be the focus, I think, of targeted education at the individual agency level. I think if there's anyone in an agency that's involved in education that's listening to this, uh, please, please, please look at your SOPs with regards to pain management in children um, and work to increase pain medication administration or non-pharmacologic ways of treating pain. Absolutely. And thank you again for sharing your time with us. This has been fascinating. There's a lot of kudos in the chat box that I'll share with you on um, this being just fascinating met methodology. It's really laying a framework for how we could think about systems planning and taking a systems approach when we see inequities. So I know that anytime we see an inequity, as EMS clinicians, at least I get that visceral reaction. No, we're doing awesome. Like, no, it can't be. Um, but using our own data and taking this to the local level too to see what is it that's going on in our systems and how can we work upstream as EMS in our unique position uh, to help patients have better outcomes. Uh, so thank you again. I do have the very unpopular task of ending us, so I will carry us out. We hope you have enjoyed and learned from this PCRF Journal Club. Please share it with other interested EMS professionals. An archive of past journal clubs can be found at pcrfpodcast.org. You can also find us on Facebook at PCRF at UCLA and on our website, prehospitalcare.org. A special thank you to our sponsors, Limmer Education, providing educational tools for success at every stage of your EMS journey. And ESO, dedicated to improving community health and safety through the power of data. Thank you.